Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this seminar on the it's called EU and the Arab Spring. During the last few years, there's been two, of course, there are several, but two very important developments in international affairs. One is the Arab transition, and the other one is the Euro crisis. Uh, uh, these are two topics that we deal with at, uh, at NUPE. We have a group on, uh, of researchers working on the Middle East and uh, geopolitics and new geopolitics emerging in the Middle East. And we also have a group of students uh, focusing on Europe and European transition. And uh, although there are quite a bit of uh, similarities and differences in the changes going on in Europe and in uh, the Arab Spring, the topic today is to have a look at the relationship between developments in Europe and the developments in uh, the southern Mediterranean region. Of course, you're familiar with these things, but in the Arab world, we have witnessed popular upheaval, revolutions, regime changes, and also the slow and painful emergence of uh, democratic rule. Uh, we have also observed, of course, wars in Syria and, uh, and Libya, and uh, we see that stable authoritarian regimes, have, which created predictability for Europe, have been replaced with regimes that, at least in the short run, provide a bit more uncertainty and unpredictability. Of course, the long-term outcome is very hard to predict. On the northern side of the Mediterranean, we have seen another kind of uncertainty. The financial and economic crisis, which has hit the southern periphery of Europe particularly hard, has led to significant changes. Increased unemployment, cuts in public spending have been at the center of attention. Of course, we have not observed similar revolutions or uh, violence or upheavals, uh, but it has certainly changed the agenda for Europe. Europe has become more introspective and has to devote its attention to internal issues. Now, if we look back a few decades to the changes in the eastern part of Europe and central Europe, Euro European Union played a key role in promoting stability and projecting its model of governance in that region. I think this was also one of the reasons why the Norwegian Nobel Committee gave the uh, Nobel Prize to the European Union. By establishing partnership and cooperation that eventually led to membership in the European Union, the EU was a key actor promoting peace and stability in its neighborhood. It transferred competence and know-how. Uh, know it also served as a model that the East European countries looked to, with some kind of admiration at least for some. <coughs> at this seminar today, we examine and discuss the interrelationship between the EU and the Arab Spring. What's the role of the EU in the Arab Spring? Is there any role at all? Do the EU play a similar role to what we have seen before, or is it insignificant? And uh, what should, role perhaps should the EU play, if there is one? And is the EU at all attractive, in some sense, for the countries affected by them or involved in this Arab transition? These are, on a shorter run, very important issues. Behind this topic, of course, is the much larger one. Uh, and that's the Mediterranean area as such. Um, it's the, this region, which has been so important for millennia, um, is kind of the Great Sea, uh, which was uh, a place where religions, cultures, economies, knowledge, and political systems met, clashed, influenced, and absorbed each other which is very nicely portrayed in a recent book by David, David Abu Lafia. It's called The Great Sea. Is this region of the Great Sea, the Mediterranean, likely to be a more integrated region? Or is this, this time characterized by uh, a stage where we see that the northern and southern shores of the Mediterranean are actually drifting apart? That's the 
huge topic. Now, uh, to discuss these, some of these issues today, uh, we've been fortunate to have uh, Natalia, Natalia Tocci as a speaker. Uh, Natalia is uh, deputy director of the Istituto Affari Internazionale, uh, the Nupi sister institute in Italy. We also signed, a, we have a cooperation agreement with them. And she has been, uh, she has a PhD in international relations from LSE. She's been a research fellow at uh, CEPS in Brussels, Chamonix fellow, uh, Marie Curie Fellow at the European University Institute in Florence and a senior fellow at the Transatlantic Academy in Washington. She also won uh, uh, the Anna Lim Award for the study of European Foreign Affairs in 2008. Her presentation would be followed by uh, some brief remarks from Pernille Rike. She is one of the people at NUPI working on EU's foreign policy and EU's policy towards the southern and, uh, and, and eastern neighborhood of the EU. And then we will open up for a discussion. I think Natalia will talk for 35 minutes or so, and then and then we proceed. So please uh, welcome uh, Natalia. The floor is yours. Thank you, and thanks uh, for the kind introduction. I'm delighted to, to be here today. So um, as mentioned, the idea of my talk was really that of <coughs> trying to give you an idea of both what the European Union has been uh, doing or trying to do uh, in the Southern Mediterranean in response to the Arab Spring or the Arab uprisings, and also try to think about what the relationship is between the EU's response or non-response in many respects and the crisis which is unfolding within the European Union itself, and of course which is afflicting particularly uh, Southern Europe, i.e. that part of Europe which has traditionally been at the forefront uh, of the European Union's Mediterranean policies. So let me begin by just giving you an overview of what the European Union has been doing so far uh, in the Arab world. Now, when the Arab uprisings broke out uh, in 2011, uh, uh, at the end of 2010, what was uh, um, interesting in many respects was the fact that the European Union and EU officials, whereas in the first few days and weeks dithered slightly, then came out very strongly in favor uh, of uh, the sort of anti-authoritarian you know, democratic uh, surge that was happening in the region. And I just wanted to uh, sort of quote to you a statement by um, Commissioner uh, Fuller uh, at the time, um, and which I find quite striking because uh, it's a statement which is incredibly forthright uh, in a very, in a sense, untypical or atypical uh, European uh, fashion. So in response to the, to the uprisings, uh, uh, Fula, responsible for the neighborhood policy uh, in the European Commission, declares, we must show humility about the past. Europe was not vocal enough in defending human rights and local democratic forces in the region. Too many of us fell prey to the assumption that authoritarian regimes were a guarantee for stability in the region. This was not even realpolitik. It was at best short-termism, and the kind of short-termism short that makes the long-term ever more difficult to build. So an incredibly strong and forthright, in a sense, uh, self-accusation uh, uh, of what the European position had been in the past. Now, all this was happening at the time in which the European Union was in the process of revising its neighborhood policy, which is the main policy instrument that the EU has uh, to deal with what happens uh, in its neighborhood, both east and, uh, and south. So, mm, firstly, let me give you an idea of what were the rationales underpinning the review of the neighborhood policy. Now, first rationale was a, essentially a bureaucratic rationale. Uh, what was interesting was that the Arab uprisings happened at a time in which the European Union was, in any case, undergoing a major midterm review of its neighborhood policy. So in a sense, this happened at a relatively convenient time. And it is no coincidence in many respects that the European Union succeeded uh, to actually put forth a new policy uh, only a few months, only basically in March uh, uh, of 2011, so only you know, three months into the Arab uprisings. And this was the case because it was already in the process and had been in the process for the last year of uh, undergoing a review of its neighborhood mm -hmm. policy. And that review, which was essentially carried out by taking in the positions of the 27 member states, engaging with civil society, uh, had already pushed in the direction of 
we need to take political reform more seriously into account. So in a sense, when the Arab uprisings happened, it came at a pretty convenient time from an internal, in a sense, commission bureaucratic rationale. The second rationale was a political stroke institutional rationale. The European Commission had been in many respects sidelined, uh, at least since 2007, 2008, uh, by the establishment of the Union for the Mediterranean. The Union for the Mediterranean was essentially an intergovernmental affair. It was largely pushed uh, by the French, by former French President Sarkozy, and the European Commission had been sidelined in this endeavor. Now, the difference between the European neighborhood policy and the Union for the Mediterranean was that whereas the neighborhood policy said, at least, it didn't do, but it said it wanted to do political reform, the Union for the Mediterranean was very clear in saying, you know, we're actually quite happy in dealing government to government uh, and cooperating with the regimes of the South. We don't particularly care that they are autocratic. Uh, we're just going to basically do business with them on communications, infrastructure, a whole set of different uh, economic and technical projects. So in a sense, the Arab uprisings really emptied the logic of the Union for the Mediterranean. Uh, sort of epitomizing this was the fact that as co-chairs of the UFM, that were on the one hand President Sarkozy uh, from France and Hosni Mubarak, not exactly a shining example of an Arab Democrat. So again, when the Arab uprisings happened, the commission in a sense jumped on this bandwagon and said, well, you know, this is my occasion to regain control of the EU's Mediterranean policies, and therefore putting at the forefront the ENP of which me, the Commission, I'm responsible for, and sidelining the UFM. And then, of course, the third rationale uh, for the review of the neighborhood policy was clearly what was happening in the region. Uh, <clears throat> so it was clear that the EU had to respond to the rev almost revolutionary, a sense, tide that was sweeping across its southern neighborhood, uh, and it had to do so uh, firstly, in a manner that put at the forefront questions related to political reform, and secondly, which took into account the growing heterogeneity uh, of the southern Mediterranean. It was pretty clear, you know, after the first few weeks and months of the Arab uprisings, that this wouldn't simply be a sort of, you know, domo domino effect uh, sweeping across the region. Yes, they would be spillover effects, but some countries would go through and did go through revolutionary change, uh, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, uh, Libya. Some countries simply got stuck in violence, or Syria clearly. Uh, some countries attempted uh, reform, uh, Morocco to a far lesser extent, uh, Jordan, uh, and some countries seriously, uh, s simply sort of uh, entrenched into uh, uh, authoritarian and neo-authoritarian practices, I mean the Gulf, uh, Algeria. Um, so this was a region that was becoming, in a sense, more heterogeneous, and its heterogeneity meant that the EU had to pursue more uh, bilateral and therefore differentiated policies. And the ENP was exactly that. Uh, it was, it, at least in principle, a policy that was tailor-made country to country. It was hub and spoke. Uh, it was not, in a sense, a multilateral uh, initiative like the Union for the Mediterranean. So moving on to what was actually done, uh, and starting with what the steps forward uh, that, has been, that have been made. Um, the steps forward were in a sense encapsulated by the famous motto, the three M's. So the review of the neighborhood policy had at its heart more money, uh, more mobility, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and more markets. So what did this mean? This essentially meant that the union, union was willing to offer more uh, to the countries uh, of the southern Mediterranean in terms of more money, it put on the table, despite the crisis in the Eurozone, which of course was already in full swing, it put on the table an extra 700 million on top of the 3.5 billion that had already been earmarked for the southern Mediterranean in the 2011-2013 period. <coughs> this was complemented by an increase of 1 billion by the European Investment Bank in terms of loans and grants, uh, and the idea of uh, opening up the mandate of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development for an initial value of one, one billion uh, directed to the southern Mediterranean. The idea was that this extra uh, increase in aid uh, would be directed to supporting, uh, of course, economic and social development uh, by projects that would be aimed at improving the business environment, supporting small and medium-sized 
enterprising, engaging in microcredit projects, uh, tackling uh, uh, income disparities, as well as pilot projects on issues such as rural development and agriculture. But of course, the, not the bulk in terms of quantity, but the bulk in terms of uh, shift in EU thinking was that there would be far more attention being paid to aid directed to uh, political reform. Um, so on top of existing instruments such as the governance facility that was already there uh, to promote uh, uh, political reform, new uh, instruments were put on the table, the civil society facility, uh, and uh, the idea of uh, establishing a European endowment for democracy, which would complement existing instruments that the European Union had to support civil society, like the European Initiative for Democracy and Human Rights, uh, the Instrument for Stability, so complement those kinds of instruments with a new instrument that would essentially be aimed at supporting political parties, uh, new social movements. Um, so giving, in a sense, EU uh, aid policy a more political uh, twist to it. Of course, the parallel here being uh, what the US does uh, with its own uh, National Endowment for Democracy. Um, so this is the first M, the more money. Uh, the second M was the more markets. Uh, and here, what the Commission put on the table was the idea of extending to the Southern Mediterranean what was already on offer uh, to uh, the Eastern European neighbors, i.e. Uh, the so-called deep and comprehensive free trade agreements. Uh, so these were an ag agreements that were essentially uh, making a step further than what the existing association agreements between the EU and the southern Mediterranean countries already had, uh, and therefore uh, deepening economic integration between the EU and the southern Mediterranean. And the Union has moved forward in some respects in this uh, by um, opening negotiation, by agreeing on negotiation directives for the deep and comprehensive tr free trade agreements with the southern Mediterranean countries. Um, the EU has also established task forces uh, to coordinate uh, European investment to the region, and there have been uh, ta first task forces uh, meetings already being carried out with Tunisia, with Jordan, and with Egypt. And then the third M, more mobility. Um, here, uh, the idea would be that uh, whereas in the past the EU had, uh, in a sense, fortress Europe had a very securitized approach to mobility, uh, and therefore, with the Mediterranean being, in a sense, a barrier rather than uh, a sea of, uh, of engagement and communication between the two shores, the idea of the mobility partnerships were that for select group uh, of people, uh, essentially business people, sort of civil society people, academics, etc., uh, there would be facilitation uh, um, in terms of mobility and, of course, then leading up, hopefully, to also to visa facilitation for some uh, 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 segments of the populations of these countries. Um, this, inter uh, this, in a sense, first part is, uh, in a sense, of the first part of an equation which was also at the heart uh, of the review of the neighborhood policy, which is the more for more. So the three M's that I've just described were the more. What was the Euro European Union willing to offer more uh, to the countries of the southern Mediterranean? The flip side of this was that uh, the EU would be offering more for more, i.e. for more reforms uh, in, in the region. Uh, simply put, this is essentially the idea of conditionality. Now, conditionality had always been part of the logic of the European neighborhood policy. And it had been in the first documents of the neighborhood policy back in 2003 and 2004. <laughs> But as and when the ENP started taking forms, uh, taking form in the, in the years that followed, conditionality was essentially dropped from the equation. And it was dropped from the equation for, for many reasons, including the fact that you know, by 2006, 2007, with the elections of uh, Hamas in 2006, with a strong showing of the Muslim Brotherhood in the 2005 Egyptian elections, uh, with a strong showing of Hezbollah uh, in the 2006 Lebanese elections, the European Union started getting cold feet about democracy, and essentially conditionality, political conditionality, started dropping uh, off uh, the ENP agenda. So the idea now was that, no, the EU would be serious about conditionality, and so it would be offering more, these three M's would be offered to those countries that were uh, serious in doing more in terms of, of reform. And then finally, uh, the ENP um, review 
really did, on paper at least, try to put civil society more at the forefront. So, uh, and, and this point is, is very much linked to the point of conditionality. So the idea was not simply that the European Union would be imposing conditionality on the countries of the southern Mediterranean, but it would be engaging in dialogue with their civil society actors in order to jointly formulate, in a sense, uh, conditions and ben benchmarks and, and best practices for these, with these actors. And some of the instruments that I was describing earlier, the civil society facility, the European Endowment for Democracy, were really going, in a sense, in this trying to go in this direction. So this is the good side. <laughs> now, now the limits. Um, so what were the major limits, the major shortcomings? What are the major limits and shortcomings uh, of uh, uh, the review of the neighborhood policy? Now, firstly, I would say that uh, a first limit is that uh, the European Union, and in particular the European Commission, as the main actor in the EU driving the review of the neighborhood policy, remains very much trapped in a logic of enlargement. Um, in a sense, the ENP always was enlargement light. Uh, it was based on the same concept in terms of giving some carrots in return for certain reforms, with the major difference being that there was not membership as a carrot on offer. Uh, the very conception of the ENP back in 2003, when then Commissioner Prodi uh, first put it on the table, uh, was basically, the slogan was, everything but institutions. Uh, which, in a sense, really encapsulates this idea of the ENP being enlargement minus. Now, this, of course, creates a serious problem. It creates a serious problem because uh, the European actors engaged in this process assume that the logic, the policy logic, will w work in the same way as it did in the case of enlargement. And, of course, it's very different in the case of the Southern Mediterranean for countries that have no prospects and indeed have no interest uh, in, joining, in joining the European Union. And how does this limit emerge? It emerges, for example, if we take the question uh, of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements. Now, as part and parcel of uh, the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements is the idea that the countries of the southern Mediterranean have to comply to a set of norms and standards and rules which are of the European Union itself. So they have to harmonize their systems to the very complex, in a sense, workings of the European Union. Now, this is costly, first point, but it's a cost that, for countries that have a prospect or an interest in joining the EU, may be worth paying. For those countries that have no interest, then it's a pretty high price to pay, and it may not actually be in the interest, and therefore it may not really be uh, of the kind of value that the European <coughs> Union thinks it is or should be uh, for the countries of the Southern Mediterranean perhaps it would be more valuable uh, for the countries of the southern Mediterranean if the EU were to liberalize its agriculture markets. Uh, or if it were to concede, for example, entry in a sort of norm and standard light uh, version of the customs union that it already has with Turkey. So these are ideas that could have been engaged, uh, that you could have engaged in, uh, had it not been fixated in many ways with this sort of enlargement minus logic uh, of, uh, of the neighborhood policy. Uh, secondly, the EU has been trapped and, and continues to be trapped in a logic of security. And this really applies uh, to the mobility partnerships. Um, so the mobility partnerships have what I was mentioning earlier, the prospect of, you know, it's very nice, uh, increased mobility for certain segments of the population. Um, but essentially, the, the, the sort of um, flip side to this is that the EU continues to ask for uh, readmission agreements uh, with these countries. So it's only willing to move ahead on the mobility partnerships if readmission agreements being signed are, are, the, uh, are the counterpart to this. Um, and <coughs> it's no coincidence uh, that um, to date the only countries uh, that have mobility partnerships with the EU in the world are three, Cape Verde, Moldova and Georgia. Why is it that no other country does this? Uh, because signing readmission agreements, A, requires a lot of capacity and capability, and B, entails a big political cost for these countries. So it's not clear that actually having mobility for a few hundred, thousand, maybe thousands, let's say thousands of people, uh, is actually a cost, uh, sorry, a benefit that is worth uh, paying the cost for in terms of uh, a readmission agreement. 
Why is this the case? It's the case because, of course, mobility and migration continue to be areas which are highly securitized uh, in the EU's uh, debate and indeed have become even more securitized uh, in the context of the Arab uprisings, uh, given, for example, the, the sort of, um, you know, when, when the Tunisian uh, and the Libyan uh, uprisings began, the flow of people coming in uh, to southern European countries. I mean, I remember uh, sort of sitting in Rome uh, at the beginning of the Arab uprisings, and whereas, you know, in many of the places this was being talked about uh, as, you know, a great democratic upheaval, I remember the, the language being used in Italy at the time was, this is a crisis. It's you know, something that somehow has to be stemmed. Why? Because there was an inflow of people uh, coming into Lampedusa. <clears throat> Second, uh, sorry, third uh, limit uh, is that uh, the EU remains in many respects, and, and the Commission remains in many respects, trapped in a logic of insularity. Um, the logic of the ENP, uh, beyond being driven by enlargement as a sort of uh, backthought, um, is also very much linked to what the EU's vision for the Euro-Mediterranean has always been. You know, back in the 1990s, there was a logic, uh, given the Oslo process, uh, given US hegemony, of the European Union, in a sense, looking after its backyard and creating a broader political context in its backyard by creating a joint Euro-Mediterranean home. Uh, today, in the 21st century, in an age of multipolarity, the EU can't simply assume that it's the only uh, you know, big brother in town. I mean, not only are the Americans there and less perhaps than, than they were in the past, but obviously still there, but other actors, other regional actors, you know, the Turks, the Gulf countries, uh, Iran, of course, uh, but also other global actors, the Chinese, the Russians. These are actors that are increasingly playing a role in, in the region. And for the EU to conceive uh, of its policies completely ignoring uh, the rest of the region and the global context clearly sets clear limits to what it can actually achieve. And epitomizing this is the fact that whereas the EU has been doing things at the bilateral level, and the ENP review is, is part of, precisely part of this, this logic, it hasn't done anything on the multilateral. Yes, there has been some talk of revamping the Union for the Mediterranean, but essentially very little has been done. And whereas many of the questions that have to do with political reform indeed have to be done at the bilateral level, at the hub and spoke level, many of the big questions concerning uh, the region, you know, from infrastructure and communication through to maritime security and you know, the sort of fight against terrorism, these require multilateral solutions. Uh, and the EU has done a very little on all of this. Uh, not only in terms of revamping its own multilateral fora, but also rethinking multilateralism, both at the sub-regional level, i.e. working with those sub-regional multilateral <laughs> initiatives which already exist, uh, the five plus five, the attempted revamping of the Union for the Arab Maghreb, uh, so attempts that are being made and already exist and which the EU could, in a sense, hook up to, uh, and also thinking multilateralism, as I said, by also taking into account the, glo the role of other uh, regional and global actors. So this is it as far as you know, the, sort of the pluses and the minuses uh, of, uh, of the EU's response uh, to the Arab Spring. Now a bit of an analysis, and this really links to the question of the Eurozone crisis, uh, as to why, it, sort of explaining what's been done. Now, in a sense, what I've been describing so far uh, is really a sort of perhaps a refinement in many ways, okay, some limits, but it's the EU has been uh, working with its existing box of tricks. Um, it hasn't really engaged in a strategic rethink uh, towards the Mediterranean. Uh, it hasn't really engaged in, in a sense, out of the box thinking. Uh, and why is this the case? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think it's the case uh, to a large extent because uh, the responses come from the institutional level. So, you know, one can criticize the Commission for what it's done, but ultimately you, can't, you can hardly blame the Commission for having worked with, with the tools that it has. Uh, you know, it is a, a new institution, it's, it's, a, it's a bureaucratic uh, uh, sort of exercise in, in many respects. The Commission and the European External Action Service have been doing what they could do. Uh, the problem is that there hasn't really been a political and strategic input coming from the Member States and which are the member states which traditionally have, 
had that political and strategic input uh, into the EU's Mediterranean policies, well, they've been the southern Mediterranean countries. And which are the countries which are suffering the most from the Eurozone crisis? Well, it's the southern, sorry, European countries. So it's the, it's the sort of Italy's and the Spain's, to a lesser extent in terms of the crisis, not in terms of med policies, uh, the French, the Portuguese. These are the countries that have always and traditionally been at the forefront uh, of the EU's Mediterranean policies. And these are countries which were deeply mired into looking into their own internal economic and, and political uh, mess. Um, you know, you just need to look at all of the precedents in terms of the EU's Mediterranean policies, the Euro-Arab dialogue, French-driven, uh, the Euro-Mediterranean partnership, French-Spanish-Italian-driven, uh, the 5 plus 5 dialogue, Italian-driven, the Union for the Mediterranean, French, all of these initiatives came from Southern Europe. Difficult to imagine a European, a sort of new European Mediterranean policy whose roots do not lie in Southern Europe. So Southern European countries have of course paid attention uh, to what is happening in the region. Uh, most notoriously, of course, uh, the French have been very active uh, at the military level, but essentially their, their reactions have been, including the military reaction, have been short-term reactions. There hasn't been a sort of long-term strategic approach and rethink uh, to uh, the, 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 the sort of developments happening in the region. It's been a sort of knee-jerk reaction, uh, largely to stem the problems, whether it was you know, stemming, in the case of Mali, for example, uh, the terrorist threat, uh, stemming migration, uh, it hasn't really been a, a sort of proactive and long-term attempt to reformulate European policies towards the region. The southern European countries have tended, because of the crisis in Europe, uh, to fall back on trying to protect their vital interests, relying on their traditional partners, uh, engaging in a rather infantile, uh, let's see who, who gets into first in Libya, for example. Uh, so in those countries that have been undergoing uh, transition and, and regime change in many respects, southern European countries have been engaging in, in sort of competition amongst themselves. Uh, why? Again, very much linked to the crisis in uh, southern Europe. Now the argument that I wanted to put forward in the rest of the time that I've, uh, I've got left um, is that of, um, of saying, well, it is in fact precisely because of the crisis in southern Europe uh, that these countries could and should uh, play a more active role in designing and revamping uh, EU policies uh, towards uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, and I'll put forward an argument which is on the one hand economic and on the other hand political. Let me begin with the economic. Now it's clear that southern European countries uh, have been and still are the major trading partners uh, of uh, the southern Mediterranean. These countries, uh, southern European countries that are in economic crisis, could actually gain a lot uh, in terms of boosting their competitiveness, boosting their productivity by engaging more economically in the Mediterranean, in the southern Mediterranean. Now, of course, there's a snag in this, i.e. there's no money. Uh, so how to engage more, how to invest more in the southern Mediterranean if your companies don't have the funds to actually do this? And, and this is where part of the sort of out-of-the-box thinking really comes in. I think what southern European countries and therefore companies should be thinking about is how to, how to engage trilaterally in the Mediterranean, but with uh, the partnering of other countries and companies that don't have the kind of economic problems that southern European countries have. Uh, and, and here, the, the two sets of partners that I have in mind are Turkey and the Gulf, the GCC. Uh, these are both actors uh, that are increasingly present in the southern Mediterranean, politically as well as economically. They are countries that are experiencing high growth. Uh, they have a strong entrepreneurial spirit, but certainly what they don't have is the level of um, the sort of level of uh, uh, technology, the the the, the know-how, uh, the sort of extent of, of innovation and capacity that southern European uh, countries and economies still have, in relative terms, of course. Um, so in many respects, one can imagine that 
by partnering in a trilateral way in this in, in this in this way um, there would be gains for both there would be clearly gains for the Turks for example partnering with Italians and doing so in Egypt uh, and of course there would be gains for the southern Mediterranean so for the Egyptians because obviously this would contribute to their own uh, to their own development how to design these trilater uh, trilateral initiatives here the idea would be that of uh, basing um, basing the concept on on value chains uh, so for example there would be companies a company in Italy at the beginning of the value chain of production partnering with a company in Turkey at a second stage and then ending up for example in, in Egypt uh, and by doing this together clearly everyone would learn from one another uh, so there'd be a clear value uh, for, for, for all three and it would contribute to the economic development uh, of all three the kinds of sectors where this would be most profitable and, and, uh, and desirable in are sectors like uh, agri-food, uh, like machinery, sectors where, which tend to be more uh, conducive uh, to the role of sm small and medium-sized enterprises, which would allow for, so to speak, a democratization of economic development. So not sectors which tend to be dominated uh, by large, large industries. So this is <coughs> as far as the economics is concerned. Last point, politically, um, how could southern European countries give EU Mediterranean policies uh, a, different, a different twist? Now, EU, generally speaking, democracy promotion policies, uh, and particularly democracy promotion policies in the southern Mediterranean, have traditionally been the turf of northern European countries. Uh, and the approach of the EU is very much influenced uh, by a Northern European approach. Southern European countries have traditionally been ex extremely cautious, if not skeptical, about democracy promotion. This was partly perhaps due to cynicism, uh, and partly perhaps due to a, a more nuanced understanding in many respects of, uh, of the region. So in the sense of the sort of pluses and, and the minuses. Now, what is clear is that in a post-Arab uprising environment, Southern European countries know they can't simply pretend to ignore the question. But at the same time, they haven't very, been very proactive in providing input to the EU's policies concerning political reform. So the EU's policies on the, on, on the question, which are the ones that I described in the first part of my talk, the more for more, the conditionality, are still very much Northern European in, in approach. I mean, the idea is that of conditionality, is that of providing you know, best templates and uh, you know, best practice templates, uh, engaging in political dialogue in a very finger-wagging way. So the approach is one of saying, we, the Europeans, we know how to do democracy. We have you know, wonderful democracies, and we're going to tell you, or impose on you, tell you, whatever, what you should be doing in the southern Mediterranean. Now, in a post-Arab Spring environment, this is an approach that doesn't really chime well. Uh, you know, these are countries which have undergoing or are, are undergoing change and feel that when, there where it's happened, they've kind of done it on its own. They've done it despite the Europeans, not, not certainly thanks to, to the Europeans. And so this is certainly, in a sense, the Egyptian story and the Tunisian uh, story. Um, and it's no coincidence that, for example, if you take the case of Egypt, uh, when the EU came up and offered uh, election monitoring uh, or it offered a mission for security sector reform, the Egyptians said, mm, thanks, but no thanks. Uh, you know, we're quite happy to do this on, on our own. Now, where does the, the southern European possible component to this come, come in? I think it comes in because the southern European countries have, in some respects, a different story to tell. Uh, they have, both because of their history and because of the current crisis, economic, which is now spilling into a political crisis in Southern Europe, they can present themselves as work in progress as well. Uh, as, uh, you know, we also have some issues. Firstly, we've undergone a transition process, which in many respects is similar to what you're undergoing now. Uh, we have also, or if you take, you know, the, the Spains, the Portugals, the Greece and the Italys, all these are countries which have had long uh, periods of authoritarian rule. Uh, these are all countries which have emerged in a very painful way from authoritarian rule uh, by reconciling uh, 
socially conservative and progressive forces. I mean, th this is the story of the Arab Mediterranean today, uh, you know, trying to sort of bridge a potentially polarized situation and finding forms of dialogue and institutionalized dialogue between different uh, political actors. This is an experience that Southern European countries in different shapes and forms have also gone through. Now, this doesn't mean that the Southern Europeans should go and tell them what to do, but it's about sharing experiences. It's about empathizing in many respects. And this is something that the Southern European ex experience can, can really contribute. If you add on to this, the crisis, today's crisis, and its political implications, you add a new... So I think that Natalia is right in saying that the EU is trapped in a logic of enlargement and security. And I think, but I think, however, that this is unavoidable in some, some way. It is not a matter of choice, rather it is uh, structural and linked to ge geography. And paradoxically, this security focus may also constitute a driver for change, uh, especially in a time of crisis. It is common to argue that the EU and NATO have their main assets and strengths in different areas, hard security for NATO and soft security for the EU. Still, both institutions are mainly, as I see it, soft security, soft power security actors in this region. But NATO's operations, like the one conducted in Libya, get most of the attention. It is still the day-to-day -day work of NATO's partnership program that is the main activities of the alliance in this region. And interestingly, this policy is not that different from the Union's neighborhood policy, apart from the obvious fact that it is limited to one sector only, the military sector. Like the neighborhood policy, the policy of, of NATO aims, um, uh, uh, aims to, to, um, to, uh, uh, to sorry, uh, aims at assisting these countries in their transformation to create, create good governance. And in the case of the military sector, it concerns a better organized security sector and increased democratic control over the national defense forces. And since 2011, both institutions are also gradually changing their, their approaches. Interestingly, both institutions have actually reframed a policy that is more bottom-up oriented than their earlier approaches. In the case of the EU, this new approach seems to focus more, as we have heard, uh, on the need to strengthen civil society and promote dialogue. In the case of NATO, it implies lifting of the partnership uh, agreement to be part of a more comprehensive partnership program similar to the one that was offered for the partnership of peace countries in the East in the 1990s. So these processes and efforts are perhaps not as visible as the more traditional top-down approaches and measures, but they may prove to be more important over time. So while conditionality, as we have heard, still is the basis of both institutions' approaches, this now seems to have been supplemented by a more active and flexible engagement, which to a larger extent takes into account also the needs of the partner countries. I, I agree with Natalia, of course, that the results of these changes have so far been rather limited, especially seen in relation to the magnitude of the changes in this region as such. But uh, on the other hand, this does not necessarily mean that these approaches have failed, but they but maybe linked to the fact that soft power mechanisms and conditionality, which still is the, at the basis of both institutions' approaches, are long-term processes that often experience setbacks before they eventually and hopefully succeed. Still, the transition in the region should be seen as a window of opportunity for both the EU and NATO as such, and perhaps uh, the southern members, uh, member states in particular. But in order to have a real impact, the two uh, institutions should perhaps strive for a clear division of labor. And this is, of course, particu particularly important in a time of crisis when there are limited resources uh, available. In addition to this, the effectiveness of both institutions also depends on whether the principle of conditionality actually works and if it has an impact. And this is, of course, not only, as we have heard, dependent on the approach of the European institutions, but also the willingness and the capacity of the partner countries in the, uh, in the South uh, to participate in these programs and activities that both NATO and the EU uh, offers and proposes. So I think, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, now we have a question and answer session. Uh, we can go on for almost 
35 minutes with that. Um, Eva, you have a microphone yes. in the back there. Uh, and uh, please, when you uh, ask your question, please identify yourself. Uh, and I guess uh, you should uh, frame the question primarily to Natalia. Uh, should we arrange so that Natalia can stand over here? Or you can stand here and I can stand myself over here? <coughs> Francesco. Yeah, hi. Uh, Francesco Stanzani from Nupi. Um, mm. I very much uh, welcome your uh, overview and the emphasis you laid on uh, the need to bring uh, uh, new forms of trilateral partnerships and the role that uh, Southeast, South uh, Mediterranean uh, county within the EU can play. Um, I wonder whether in, in seeing a, a role for Turkey and the Gulf countries, however, um, you might not be overlooking the fact that they do have their own political agenda in the region, um, that uh, money from the Gulf uh, comes with uh, certain uh, political interests attached to that, and that uh, this might make the picture a bit more complicated when it comes to uh, you know, a transnationalist hypothesis of uh, three liberal ideas floating uh, across the, the region. Uh, and uh, attached to that, I would like to ask you whether uh, you think that uh, the, what you call the security logic trap uh, is something that we are going to see increasing in, in the near future as the EU is defining uh, or is driven, this is at least my way of seeing uh, uh, an agenda which is very much driven by domestic uh, uh, issues uh, which are quite slippery such as uh, terrorism and organized crime in the region and that don't help. Uh, you know taking apart the, the, the traditional state security thinking, which in the region is even more st stronger than in Europe. You think about Morocco and Algeria, who still don't talk to each other, and now we're going to see what happens in, in, the, in the south of those countries these days. Thank you. On <coughs> Turkey and the Gulf and, and their respective political agendas, and my, my argument was on the trilateralism in this respect was uh, was only focused on the economic, precisely because on the political it would be, particularly with the Gulf, with Turkey, you know, there could be a, an interesting, I think, division of labor, and perhaps I'll say a few words on that. But with the Gulf, it's um, not exactly <laughs> where we want to go. Uh, but on the economic, uh, in terms of thinking about joint investments in the region, I think there could be some, some space for, for cooperation. Uh, and I say it because, <clears throat> The Gulf, as, uh, as you know, has been, of course, investing in the southern Mediterranean for a while. Uh, but from my understanding of, uh, you know, from, from people from the region, there's also an appreciation that the kind of investments that they've made in the past, uh, because of the conditions in the countries in the region, were perhaps not such a big, you know, such a good idea. So focusing on the sort of big investment projects, the big infrastructure projects, didn't really pay paid well, given the conditions in the region. So they have become more interested in focusing on more, not necessarily micro, but perhaps meso sectors, um, where <coughs> European companies tend to play uh, also a potentially uh, greater role in. So that there could be some scope, in a sense, for cooperation there. But on the political, I completely agree with you. With Turkey, I think, and, and I didn't mention this in, in, in my talk, but, but I'll, I'll raise it here, I think there could be some scope for cooperation at the political level too. Um, and, and I say it because I think there's a, a, a potential interesting division of labor between the two. Uh, the EU is strong and will continue to be strong on issues related, for example, to uh, human rights, meaning mainly individual uh, civil rights, uh, rule of law, um, issues which have a strong grounding in many respects on international law in, 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 different, uh, in different spheres. Um, it has far less credibility in, in speaking out on the more overtly political questions um, because of essentially reputation and, and credibility problems. Um, Turkey, I think, is in a reverse position. Uh, so it's been doing quite well in terms of engaging on, on very political topics uh, with, you know, different incarnations of the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, I mean, imagine, you know, so going back, for example, to Tayyip Erdogan, Turkish Prime Minister's speech in, in Cairo last, uh, last year, or was it a year and a half ago, I can't remember, 
um, when you know, Erdogan came to Cairo and spoke out in favor of secularism. I mean, imagine, and he already got a negative reaction, yeah? But imagine if that kind of speech had been made by any EU leader. I mean, you know, they would have been up in arms. The fact that it was a Islamist or post-Islamist that was actually making a, a call for a very political question like secularism was received less negatively, I think, than what it would have done had it come from uh, another European uh, leader. Uh, at the same time, I think Turkey is playing, it risks to play a negative role in the region by focusing only on the, um, how to say, not, not political, but sectarian uh, sort of side of things. Um, so by engaging, for example, only uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, and not doing, for example, political party development with those actors in the region that would most need it, you know, the youth movements, those that did the revolution but haven't quite made it into establishing traditional, so to speak, political parties that then you need to win elections. Um, so the Europeans could perhaps push the Turks uh, more in, in, in this direction. Um, on the issue of the security logic, yes, I agree, and I think it will increase. And I think it will increase because on top of what we have already seen, uh, um, you know, over basically since 9-11, as, as of course we all know, uh, there was a, a, an increased security logic uh, driven by, you know, the fear of terrorism, Islamophobia, et cetera, et cetera. Now on top of that, you have a much broader populist uh, trend uh, which is very much linked, of course, to the crisis, uh, which doesn't have the same identity, in a sense, connotations and what, had, what was there in, in the past, uh, but it leads to the same degree of introspection and insularity, uh, which could uh, have repercussions uh, in, in terms of a heightened security approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see that there are lots of very uh, competent people on, uh, not only on EU's policy, but also on the, the Northern Africa and the Arab region in the audience area. So it's, feel free, of course, to ask questions from that perspective as well. But what we've heard through the two presentations is very much EU's adaptations and search for new instruments towards the region. But I know that lots of you here also have some experience about how this region see the EU. So that would be nice as well. Uh, Ula Fernandez, please. Yeah, Ola Tunander from uh, Priu. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, the migration issue and uh, human trafficking and so on that has been very important for Italy. And uh, I know there was an agreement 2008-2009 uh, between Italy and uh, Libya where they decided to, to have the, the, Lib the Italian Navy to patrol to stop the migration. And uh, this was, of course, very important uh, for Italy in a sense, and it was, but it also had a lot of consequences for Libya because uh, the, the human trafficking mafia in Benghazi and Misrata lost a lot of billions, you could say. And, uh, and, uh, and it became also more black people coming up that were actually trying to get north. So, and this kind of situation led to a kind of racist attacks on blacks, actually, in, in that also happened in 2000, with hundreds of, of blacks killed in, in Misrata and Benghazi. Uh, but uh, now, when they uh, made their revolt in these cities and, and took over uh, from the Gaddafi regime, this means that they uh, may not be have the same view as the Italians, so to speak, because the, the, the Italians rather want to, to limit the migration while the people who took over actually were the people who, who were trying to get more of, uh, of uh, trafficking, actually. So how do, how do you think Italy and EU will handle this uh, development? Thank you. It's a very important question and, and I'll respond to it putting it also in, in the broader context. I mean in terms of the Italy-Libya friendship agreement which was uh, which had some of course very problematic aspects in terms of, uh, of the human rights dimension. Um, of course it was you know when the Libyan revolution happened it was a big source of embarrassment and the agreement was suspended and blah blah blah. Um, 
Now, I think you, you, what you're driving at is, is a very important question, which isn't only an Italian-Libyan story, but is a, a broader story about uh, the EU's uh, relations with uh, southern Mediterranean countries on the migration aspect. Um, if I can put it in a nutshell, uh, the name of the game in the past was regimes in the region that lacked internal legitimacy uh, tried to gain external legitimacy by giving to the Europeans what they needed, largely uh, migration, energy in other respects, cooperation in the fight against terrorism, that kind of, in a sense, box of tricks. Um, so they, they relied on that external legitimacy despite the fact that they lacked internal legitimacy and in fact were able to give those goodies um, to the Europeans precisely because they lacked that, in a sense, democratic legitimacy. Now, uh, and in return, got, got different benefits. Um, so in a sense, there was a, a balance there. Mm -hmm. now, now we're moving in a situation in which, of course, we're not ending up with wonderfully democratic re regimes in the region, but there's certainly regimes that are more responsive to their populations, or at least cannot simply ignore what their populations want and, and think in the same way as you know, the regimes of, uh, of the past. Which means that on the migration question, uh, if it was already difficult to negotiate readmission agreements in the past, my sense is that it, now it's become close to impossible. Um, I don't think that the EU has really um, reckoned with the implications of this fact. Uh, I think the approach still remains the same, uh, but I think at some point something will have to give because. Uh, uh, we simply, I mean, the regimes now have a degree of internal legitimacy that they don't have, in, you know, they didn't have in the past. They don't need our goodies as much as they did in the past. Uh, and the cost for them to, to give, you know, to, to give us what we want are, are far higher. Uh, so that the bargain will have to change. I, I can't tell you in which direction it's going to go, but what I can assume is that it won't be the one of the, of the past. Uh, okay, uh, since I don't have any others, uh, let me uh, ask you a question. Because you presented lots of interesting stuff in your presentation, but at the, one, at the same time you presented somehow it's a bit um, it's a, the direction uh, where you see or you would like it to evolve is, is one in the spirit of cooperation. And, and you point to the fact that uh, the crisis in Europe and also the transition in, in, in uh, Arab countries, those kind of undermine the possibilities of making these reforms, and, and my, and that's the, that's the key factor somehow that has left the EU uh, unable to make proper responses, and, and uh, the Arab countries not to, to act upon them properly. And, but my point is, I think a bit in relation to what Ola Sander raised, in, because there are obviously some deep conflicts here as well, uh, and. Uh, uh, because on one hand, these countries, they compete. You said you, your constructive suggestion on developing this triangle. Uh, obviously, the Southern European countries and the Arab countries, they compete in terms of workplaces. Uh, they also compete uh, or have conflict of interest regarding migration, uh, even tourism, industry development. Uh, and also, I think they have, in the South on the standings, somehow, some Southern Europeans, they, they find themselves as certainly not being on the southern from from the Arab world, they are from the European world. So there are lots of kind of identity uh, actions as well, kind of driving, driving this apart. So so my first question is, the, the consequences of what you are, have been saying today, is that leading towards more separation between uh, these different northern and southern shores of the Mediterranean? Or is it likely that we'll see more integration? So that's the first question. And, 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 uh, and the, the second point is, uh, could you say a few more things about how EU, is it so that the EU has been some way or the other affecting, triggering the Arab Spring? Has it affected the evolution of the Arab Spring, or does it in any, any way at all affect the developments going on in, in, uh, in uh, 
the Mediterranean, the southern Mediterranean region today? Or is simply Europe insignificant? Um, <coughs> on the question of um, is this moving towards greater integration or, or, or separation? Um, huh. Well, obviously one would need a crystal ball uh, to, to answer this question because we're essentially talking about two moving targets. Uh, the Arab world is changing, the EU is changing. And uh, let me take this, so on, on the way in which the Arab uprisings will uh, develop, this is, I think, at this point, anyone's guess, you know. Uh, is the new steady state at some point, a few probably decades, I guess, down the line, going to be more democratic or, or not? If I were to give despite Syria, an answer today, I would probably say it's probably going to be better than in the past, but we will probably have to go through a, a good few years, if not decades, of, of rough patches. But that is just a, a, an optimistic guess at this, at this point. Um, on the EU side, and perhaps to give a slightly more informed guess, uh, or a guess where, where there are more elements, in a sense, to, 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 to make some kind of speculation, uh, I think this will largely depend on the way in which the European Union will exit from the crisis. Now, I think what we're witnessing uh, today is that, okay, what we know today is that if the EU manages to exit from the crisis, uh, it will have to do so in a manner which uh, foresees a core which is far more integrated than what we've known so far. Uh, you know, banking union, fiscal union, political union, different shapes and forms, but it's, and I'm simplifying, it's going in a federal direction. Yeah? So this we more or less know. Yeah? We don't know whether it's going to happen, but we know that if we exit the crisis, it's going to be looking something like this. What we also know today is that not everyone's going to be in this club. You know, the UK has made it already crystal clear. Um, is Sweden going to be in? Are the Poles going to be in? I mean, uh, are the current candidate countries, the Western Balkans, etc., going to be in? Well, big question mark, yeah? What we definitely know is that the UK is not going to be in. Now, option number one, you know, these countries are going to exit the European Union at some point altogether. I think it's, as of today, I think this is quite unlikely. Um, so, to put it very simply, we are essentially talking about a European Union which is not going to move ahead as a monolithic bloc. Now, in this kind of future European Union, um, and, and, and here I'm going to your question, um, in which there will be um, there will be a core and a non-core. Whether this non-core is going to be a hub and spoke, whether it's going to be a periphery, whether there are going to be multiple clusters, uh, but it's going to be a more differentiated union, in which because of that greater differentiation and because of different layers and levels of integration, uh, it may become more e easy in some respects uh, to integrate more and to cooperate more with non-member states, including those in the southern Mediterranean. Um, on the, has the EU effect, well, it hasn't triggered, triggered the Irish Spring in any shape or form, if anything it was an obstacle to it in the same way as the United States and the rest of the world was. Um, has it influenced uh, the Arab Spring? I mean, here I would in a sense follow what Pernilla was, was, uh, was saying. I think, you know, the kind of things that the EU is doing are very long-term in nature. And I think the jury is still out as to whether they're having an impact at all, and, and if they are, whether that impact is positive or, or otherwise. Uh, the EU does matter. I mean, ultimately, it is you know, the biggest external actor uh, at the doorstep uh, of, uh, of this region. So it will matter inevitably far more for Northern Africa than, than for the Mashrek region. Um, but the EU is only one of other external actors. So it will not be the determinant factor here. OK, uh, then uh, first in the back there. Yeah, hi, Toga. If I could also have a question, I thank you. Why I am um, to quote the Chairman Mao and what to do? I think that is actually the only interesting question uh, in this context. And uh, so I would like you to elaborate more on your um, uh, uh, suggested plan about the uh, EU uh, cooperation between uh, I mean, with uh, Turkey and uh, the GCC. And uh, now, with my my background from the region, which is admittedly uh, limited, I've been to Saudi Arabia and Yemen for some time. And um, I think that the fact we tend to overlook in the current um, crisis is that it is actually a political crisis. It's a crisis among the political elite, and the Muslim Brotherhood, of course, is 
for all practical purposes, just a, another vehicle for individuals to uh, acquire positions of, of power. Um, but alongside this uh, political arena, there is a, uh, an alternative arena of cooperation, which is trade. Uh, and I think that in all these countries, you find that uh, while in the political arena, um, you know, politics thrives on conflict. And you know, like a conflict is an asset in your own struggle for success. In the commercial arena, it's the opposite. I mean, in all business, uh, you have to agree on the compromise uh, price to reap a uh, win-win situation, which is profit. Uh, and so I think that is actually a very interesting um, uh, proposal. I would like you to elaborate on that, because obviously, I mean, at the moment, it's not realistic to have any kind of um, pull from the EU in terms of uh, investments or, or, um, or markets. Uh, it would have to be an option to develop a regional uh, market, regional growth engine, so to speak. And if you look at this region, I mean, it's not poor. Uh, it has oil, gas, um, and uh, it has every, um, every um, condition for growth. I mean, the only, they even have fish. So they're actually like Norway, you know? Uh, so I think that is the way forward. And I think it's the way forward because you would then interact with uh, uh, an alternative uh, elite in these countries that have more of a, a, minim a mental uh, or, or mind more amenable to, uh, to cooperation and compromise. And then, uh, as I I'm very disturbed that NATO uh, sees a role in these uh, countries. I mean, uh, is already uh, overly militarized and uh, overly armed. And uh, so please uh, keep NATO up to it. Thank you. I'll leave the NATO point uh, to Pernille. Um, <laughs> on, uh, on the, um, on the, the, the trade and the economic dimension, um, perhaps let me elaborate by uh, giving you a bit of background of, of where I got this idea from. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got this idea because um, uh, in Turkey, there is actually a project uh, along these lines, and it's a project that is being uh, funded by the Chambers of Commerce, and it's called the Global no, I can't remember, Global Turkey Initiative, something along these lines. Uh, and what they're doing is precisely that of, but they're not doing it only with the Europeans, but they're basically looking at what Turkish businesses can do together with businesses from other countries in the Mediterranean. So. Now, their entire foreign policy has been very economic driven. I mean, the whole zero problems with neighbors policy, uh, the whole entry, in a sense, of Turkey in the Middle East uh, is very, very much linked to the fact that the new elite in power in Turkey, the so-called, uh, uh, well, I mean, linked very much to a constituency of the so-called Anatolian Tigers, didn't have that traditional relationship with Europe that the old elites in, uh, in Istanbul had, and felt the need to penetrate markets which they could access to, because they didn't need a Schengen visa, um, and, and therefore push the government to enter these markets. But they're very much aware of the fact that they're still lagging behind in terms of uh, you know, their capacity to, have to, to create global brands, uh, basically their capacity to become a high-tech, uh, you know, high-tech businesses and therefore a high-tech economy, and make that jump uh, in terms of uh, productivity and competitiveness uh, to make the move from, in a sense, a middle-income country through to uh, a developed uh, uh, country and high-income economy. So they're thinking a lot along these lines. Now, what it was striking to me is that, and, and it's linked to the point of insularity that I was making earlier about the European approach, the EU approach to this, is that uh, the EU has set up these task forces for the countries in the region. And the idea of these task forces are that they're big, um, sense venues, meeting points uh, for European investors to come and think about what they can be doing in the region. But they haven't thought, and this is very much an EU approach, they haven't thought about inviting others. So uh, whereas the, the Turkish initiative is, is, is small, because Turkey is obviously much smaller compared to the EU as a whole, uh, if that kind of trilateral approach was applied at EU level, uh, the sort of multiplier effects would obviously be far, far greater. So that's, in a sense, the logic uh, in which I was, uh, I, was, I was thinking. But on, on NATO, I don't know if you want to. So should NATO simply keep out 
actually don't have an opinion on that, but uh, <laughs> what I do in my paper, I just look at what people in NATO are actually doing. And NATO has a policy and has had a policy for some time towards that region, and it's not very, very well known, because the, it's, of course, the military operation, like the Libya operation, that gets all the attention. But actually, what the NATO tries to do is to try to help these countries to have democratic control of their national defense forces, to, to assist the security sector reform, and these kind of things. But I think that NATO has an image problem, of course, in the region. And that complicates what they, they can achieve. And, and uh, when I went to NATO to interview NATO officials, they said that the problem now is that most of these countries are not interested in any assistance from NATO. So what NATO offers is not kind of Okay, there are lots of challenges, both on the supply side and the demand side. Here. Now, uh, over here. Yep. Uh, my name is Tone Rand. I have experience from four international organizations, but I'm here in my personal capacity. Uh, thank you very much for a most interesting presentation of the situation, and I found your analysis very, very good. Uh, I particularly uh, found your uh, idea about trilateral cooperation very, very interesting and refreshing. I think it's important to be able to think out of the box. And when the situation is challenging as it is for the moment, I think it's even more important to be creative. Uh, but to what extent do you consider that this approach uh, will be realistic? And will there be concrete results in the foreseeable future? Uh, and then the other aspect I would like to have your evaluation of is the cooperation between uh, the EU and NATO. I know that you have really studied EU approach, but still, to what extent do you think it will be possible for the EU and NATO to share uh, tasks and responsibilities between them? Um, and to what extent do you think that uh, what might come out of this cooperation will be concrete and realistic? Uh, and uh, what do you think would be the time aspect? Is it likely that something would come out in a foreseeable future? Thank you very much. Um, on the, the trilateral idea and whether it's, um, it's realistic, I mean, there's nothing legally or institutionally that is preventing this, yeah? Because we're not talking about uh, uh, you know, external countries participating in the institutions. I mean, the kind of thing that make EU institutions go berserk. So it is possible. Now, whether it's realistic, well, I mean, that's uh, obviously a big question mark. What I can say to you is that I did raise this question with uh, people from uh, Kathy Ashton's cabinet, uh, and they took notes. Uh, so their reaction was, oh, this is impossible. Their reaction was, oh, that's interesting. Whether that means anything is, of course, an entirely Different, different question, but at least the reaction was not was not negative. Um, on uh, EU NATO cooperation, um, again, Fadila is far more more knowledgeable than I am on this question. Uh, but let me perhaps just say here that uh, unless the, the, the Cypriot Turkish issue is not resolved, uh, it's very difficult to imagine uh, a way a way forward. Uh, whether there are prospects for resolving that. Um, uh, difficult to be optimistic uh, on this question, but I think there are a few possible rays of light that one could latch onto. Uh, and this is essentially due to the new dynamics that we are being uh, created by the gas mines uh, in the eastern Mediterranean, uh, coupled to the, the weakening in many respects of the Republic of Cyprus uh, due to the, the bailout and, and, and the crisis. Uh, now this coupled again with the fact that uh, in Cyprus there is a precedent, uh, Anastasiadis, uh, that back in 2004 had backed the Annan plan. Uh, now whether he's going to stay in power after the bailout is a different question. Um, but if uh, these three elements are brought together, you begin to see a political a potential constellation uh, uh, of stars that could be uh, more fortuitous than what, what it has been over the past few years. Uh, added to this is the fact that the EU as such has its hands tied. It ha can't really do much on Cyprus because it's become part of the problem in a sense. Uh, 
Uh, the other external actor that could be doing something about this and hasn't over the last few years uh, is the United States. And it could be that because of uh, the uh, gas dynamics uh, and the fact that the US is very much involved at business level, I mean, with uh, mobile energy, uh, both on the Israeli and on the Cypriot side, it obviously has a strong interest in the Turkish-Israeli uh, rapprochement and was, was obviously the one brokering uh, the agreement. So it could have a stake in re-energizing the peace process in Cyprus. But to go back to your question, unless that uh, issue is not unblocked, it's very difficult to imagine cooperation between the EU and the Okay, then uh, Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have two questions. The first Excuse one. Can you pre pre present, present yourself, please? Okay. Uh, my name is Mehran Sirani. I'm uh, a student of international relations uh, from UNB. Uh, I have two questions. The first question, maybe uh, in your presentation, actually, uh, you have touched it. I missed it. However, I ask it. Uh, do you see any relationship uh, between actually the Arab Spring? and the broad uh, Middle East and North Africa program explored by Colin Powell. I mean, in a way, that Arab Spring is some type of backlash of, or uh, aftershock of that uh, program. And uh, my second question is the series of changes actually we see in the Middle East is mostly in the favor of religious organizations such as Muslim Brotherhoods and some type of this organization. And so far we have actually observed that two countries of, uh, for example, Libya and Egypt, the constitution actually of these countries is almost based on Sharia law. And at the other side also we see that Saudi Arabia actually play an important role in this direction. Yeah. Do you see any, uh, are you agree with this point that we are going to have some type of regional religious actually hegemony? in the Middle East particularly. And in this way, since the EU actually depends on the energy and also a strategic part of Kamal, Suez Canal, don't you see any threat in the future actually for the EU? Thank you. Um, on the relationship between the Arab Spring and uh, the, the US approach uh, with the broader Middle East and North Africa uh, initiative, is there a relationship uh, well, no, I don't really see a relationship in the sense that um, the U.S. approach to democracy promotion under the, the Bush administrations um, was, of course, very much in the civilizational prism of post nine, you know, of the post nine eleven world. Uh, precisely because it was very much shaped in, in, in that environment. Um, the minute in which democracy or, or the sort of the opening up, the relative opening up of, of some countries started to uh, reveal the strong showing of Islamist forces. Uh, so I mentioned, you know, sort of 2005 elections in Egypt, that obviously the big Hamas uh, uh, story in 2006, the, the, the sort of the strengthening of Hezbollah. The United States and the European Union, for that matter, completely backed off the whole democracy promotion story. Uh, and you know, I was mentioning the fact that the Union for the Mediterranean on the EU side of things was, in a sense, a reaction uh, to this. Uh, this. A similar story can be said about the United States. I mean, basically, both uh, the EU and the US started getting cold feet about democracy. And the Arab uprisings happened in this context. Plus, the Arab uprisings at least in their initial manifestation, had um, a very strong, in a sense, civic rather than sectarian color to them. Uh, you know, the sort of uh, the youth in Tahrir was uh, it was not the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood rode the wave, uh, and and what we are seeing is partly the fact that Islamist act, you know, the, the fact that Islamists have in a sense overtaken in a sense the revolution. Uh, I think is the, the product 